Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Ed Summit live stream. I'm Brian Walker. It's great to have you here, whether it's morning for you as it is for us here in beautiful Napa Valley, or whether it's you know afternoon or evening, depending on where you are. Thank you so much for being here. I'm joined by the wonderful and talented Cheryl Dorsey. Thank you, Cheryl, for being here. Thank you so, so much. It's so exciting to be here in Napa Valley, to be here at the Edge Summit. It's going to be an incredible day of incredible content, talking the future of AI, of commerce, of shopping. And we're going to dive into some incredible topics and we're going to have amazing interviews throughout the day. Yeah, so what you can expect is we're going to be kind of going between the studio here uh, on campus, a short distance from where all the different keynotes are happening, and then we'll cut over there. So you'll hear from some fantastic speakers, including Raj Dadada and Anirban uh, Bartole and, and many others, um, and really try to dive deep into all the different opportunities, challenges, and issues related to AI's influence on digital commerce and digital marketing. So we're excited to you know, share with you our perspective and interview a whole host of different guests in here in the studio, including the speakers you're going to hear from, uh, to kind of dig even deeper and understand. We've got many startups that we're going to spe be speaking to and industry leaders who have aggregated here and congregated here in, in, in Napa Valley for this fantastic couple of days. So we're excited to bring that to you. Cheryl, I'd love for you to maybe share a little bit more about your background. Obviously, yeah. I know you from your fantastic podcast, the TED uh, Technology yes, Podcast, yes. but I'd love for you to share a little bit more about your background. Yeah, so again, Cheryl Dorsey, and um, I'm a data journalist by training. Um, I started off in the world of startups, working for companies like Uber, as well as Google Fiber and Microsoft. So have a really strong like tech background at some of the most leading and transformative companies. So kind of a content marketing kind of, kind of um, thing? Marketing, or, yeah. sales, yeah. Um, and also storytelling, particularly uh -huh. yeah. with data. Uh -huh. um, and I launched a publication uh, back in 2016 called The Plug. And I covered diversity within the tech oh, space wonderful. and um, became uh, syndicated on the Bloomberg Terminal. I sold that business back in April. And right now I do a lot of hosting. As you know, I host the TED Tech podcast. So I get to talk, I get to talk tech and, <laughs> and, and cover incredible minds yeah. that are thinking about um, AI, the future of AI, its implications and applications. Mm -hmm. So just even recently um, at the TED uh, 2022 uh, conference last year, there was this entire scope of all the things that we can actually do with AI. So I'm really excited for us to be diving in today. And I care a great deal about the future of work, which we know AI is going to be influencing yeah. a lot. So um, I authored a book that was published by Wiley and came out in 2021 called Upper Hand, The Future of Work for the Rest of Us. Great title. Really giving, thank you. <laughs> really giving this scope of what are gonna be the careers that are gonna mm -hmm. define the future. And I believe today we're also gonna be talking about, you know, the the job market um, right. as as we're, we're looking at um, AI's influence on, on, on digital marketing, mm -hmm. um, as well as the overall shopping experience. Absolutely, I think we'll be diving into the implications on the, the back office, if you will, you know, how merchants, how marketers will be engaging, how the tools they use to run and drive their business is going to evolve and change with the influence of AI and generative AI. And then we'll be talking about the customer experience. What can we expect in terms of evolution and change? You know, I've been in this industry for, I actually did the math this morning, over 25 years. That's a long time. It explains the gray in the beard. <laughs> and I've been, um, you know, a merchant. That's really kind of how I first got involved in digital commerce. It was 1998. Actually, our first project was a CD-ROM. We called it interactive media department uh, within the, the retailer that I worked for at the time. And we were mailing CDs to customers who would load them up on their computer, interact with the catalog via CD-ROM, and then create a file that would get emailed to the customer service center who would rekey, of course, the order, right? So that was wow, early, times early, have early, changed. right? And that was dial-up, right? Was uh, that it was the dial-up actually... era? Almost really, it was dial up, it happened by then. But okay. this was like a way for us to create e commerce in a sense, yeah. digital commerce, um, without relying on, you know, web. The first web business we really launched was actually on AOL. It was, uh, it was an it. AOL store, um, sort of a virtual mall concept, very cartoony, 
brand, all the different brands. You had to pay, of course, to play, essentially, uh, in, inside that environment. And obviously, things evolved very fast from there. Um, I've had the good fortune of being in lots of different roles uh, inside this market. I started out as a merchant, as I mentioned. Then I ran digital marketing. Then I ran technology services within a retailer. And then I sort of turned into an internal consultant working for the uh, auto group out of Germany, who also owned a bunch of American brands. And then that led me to Amazon, uh, where I ended up uh, essentially getting involved more on the software side, uh, working to help support merchants coming onto the Amazon platform at the time. So you can think about a Marks and Spencer, a Target, mm -hmm. um, a, 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 you know, uh, um, it wasn't Barnes and Noble. Goodness, Borders, of Borders. course. Oh, yes, yeah. <laughs> I lost yeah, yeah. blank there that for a minute. That was an era. It's a long time era. ago. Borders, unfortunately, is no longer uh, with us. It's great to see Barnes and Noble making a resurgence. Mm -hmm. And then um, I actually went into online travel, spent some time product managing the new platform um, at Expedia. So actually, Dara, I don't know if you worked with Dara at Uber. He probably wasn't there when you were there. No, I'm no, guessing. no, no, no. Okay, he he got worked, me after I left, yeah. Yeah, so I worked for Dara uh, at Expedia before he went to Uber and, and, nice. and led the, the platform. Platform. And then I uh, went to Forrester Research, uh, where I uh, led the commerce technology research for, for five kind of seminal years in the evolution of this market. Um, and was was a great opportunity to kind of define um, certain different concepts that we're still talking about today. Personalization, the role of data and AI uh, in this market, uh, digital experience platforms, obviously commerce platforms and the entire ecosystem around commerce that's needed to, to drive the experience, order management, product information management, you name it. Um, and then that's when I made this shift into the software side. And I went to Hybris pre-SAP acquisition. Um, I was very fortunate to just join a phenomenal team. Uh, we ended up, as many of you know, getting acquired by uh, SAP. That product is still SAP's commerce solution. Um, and then, then I was there for a number of years as we built a phenomenal business within SAP. And then I went to the consulting side and led the commerce offering at Accenture uh, for a period of time before I decided, for me, I wanted to get back into the software side. And that led me to Bloomreach, where I was chief strategy officer and ran marketing and channel and a number of other uh, areas within the Bloomreach business uh, for four years. I did most recently leave, um, so I'm now an alumni of Bloomreach. It's great to be here at the event and see all my uh, colleagues that I worked so closely with over the last four years. And now I'm doing sort of boutique strategic advisory, but I do have a newsletter I'd love for you to check out where I'm really diving into topics related to this industry, such as the role of generative AI and the impact on, on marketing and, and merchandising. But I'm also pairing that with cocktails, which is a passion of mine, mixology. And so I'm, I'm trying to bring a little something different to the newsletter. I've been talking to lots of people here at the show who've, who've been reading and subscribing, which is wonderful. Uh, thank, thank, thank you all if, if, if a number of you are subscribing. And I'm really just trying to give you a reason to open the newsletter. You may not care what I have to say about commerce that week, but you might want the cocktail recipe. The cocktail recipe, <laughs> absolutely. I, I, think, I, think, I think we all will appreciate that as well. Um, I think your journey has been so fascinating. Um, one of the things that I noticed is that you went to the University of Washington. I did. Go um, dogs. Yes. So I'm, I'm originally from Seattle, Washington. Are you? I didn't realize yeah, that. Yeah. Oh. So I actually was in a high school program learning how to code. All right. Which high school did you go so, to? So, well, I went to Franklin. Oh, okay, yeah. Gonna, Great okay. high school. Yes. Yes. Went to Franklin. <laughs> went, went to Franklin. Sometimes it can be, rival high schools can be, can well, be problematic. Franklin's right in Franklin's right in the heart of Seattle. It's, it's a very... Uh, very famous high school. Yes. Right. Quincy yes. Jones, a bunch of phenomenal Kenny musicians. G. Yeah, lots of Kenny lots of G. great. Yeah. 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 Sometimes in Seattle we don't really take credit for Kenny G. No, I'm just kidding. That's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> but but it, it's really fascinating because I did notice you went to the University of Washington and you studied English. Yes. So you gotta tell me now how and, and I have a pretty interesting like a origin story uh -huh. from studying fashion and going to more uh -huh. of a business of fashion yeah. school and landing in this space of technology and doing the work that you're yeah. doing. But yeah. tell me about that migration into 
studying English and then kind of, you know, moving yeah. into these, these different spheres within tech. Yeah. Um, it's a long story and I'm going to try to keep it very brief. I right. can, I, my stories sometimes can be a little long. And even though we do have a little bit of time before the keynotes <laughs> kick off, I want to be uh, respectful of everyone's time. Um, yeah, I, I still really rely on what I've learned, not only then, but in my career around communication. Mm -hmm. And I actually am a very strong advocate for liberal arts educations because I think it's about being curious, learning, being open to the world, and learning how to communicate. And so that's what my college education was really about. Now, I'll be honest, when I graduated from the UW uh, with a creative writing degree, I uh, realized like my prospects of actually making a living as a creative writer. We're going to be pretty challenging. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a partly, little difficult. <laughs> partly because of what I was writing, which was sort of like high concept poetry, narrative prose ish thing that which frankly, the world needs. Well, maybe however. the world needs it and I still write. <laughs> yeah. So I'm actually, I'm working on a novel right now and I've continued to do creative writing throughout my life. Yeah. Um, as kind of a passion and I read a lot of poetry and I subscribe to a lot of poetry pie. It's an interest of mine and it's an interest of mine. And those of you who um, are in a part of the Hybris diaspora would have noticed that Karsten Toma, the founder of, of Hybris, just recently uh, posted about the 10 year anniversary of the SAP acquisition and included one of my poems in the, in the post, which was like the first time any of my poetry has ever showed up on LinkedIn. I can guarantee you Can you, you recite that. it for us? No, I can't recite it. Um, I, I don't know that I have it really committed to memory. Okay. okay. Um, <laughs> but yeah. But was Way the general- to put me on the spot, Okay, Cheryl. okay. But <laughs> <laughs> but your poetry ended up in this great piece celebrating so, the 10-year anniversary yeah, of yeah. acquisition. So anyway, creative writing and, and communication um, has been a part, key part of my career uh, ever since. And I think there's a really interesting, especially as a marketer and a strategist, um, which is really the, the, the role essentially that I've played primarily in this, in this market. And yes, I got involved in product management when I was at Expedia. I got involved in product management when I was at Amazon because I understood how merchandising and marketing works yeah. really well. It's and the storytelling. It's the connection. That's right. It's, it's the psychology behind everything. And I could communicate to the business mm -hmm. and I could communicate to the technology teams. And that's the reason why I ended up in that interesting role kind of in between them. Yeah. And I love, I love that you brought that as well throughout your career, but particularly here at Bloom Reach. And I had, I had the fortune of hopping on the shuttle this morning to get here today and sitting with some Bloom with some Bloom Reach, you know, employees and folks who are coming from very diverse backgrounds yeah, yeah. that you wouldn't have thought. And folks who were like, you know, I was a I was a I was trained as a psychologist. Mm -hmm. You know, I was working yeah. as a university counselor for athletes. Uh -huh. And now I am on a business development team, yeah. a partnership team. Yep. And the way and I never would have thought that like I'm using these skill sets mm -hmm. um, within this realm to really design experiences even from a user experience yeah. standpoint yeah. Um, and i went to the fashion institute of technology oh wonderful school and as you were talking i was thinking about the parallels of how technology started to change the way that designers yeah. and even um, like beauty brands i worked for a couple yeah. of beauty beauty companies i worked for um, designers who were thinking so much more about mm -hmm. not just being able to sell online mm -hmm. at to cart that kind of remember mm -hmm. that like funky mm -hmm. PayPal button oh, kind yeah. of thing, right? Like uh, some sites had like that where it was very clunky. Yeah. Um, but how forward thinking they were thinking from the shopping experience overall, um, especially as this world of even social media started to connect mm -hmm. and how like when I think of some of the brands that are going to be represented here today, mm -hmm. I remember getting my first ad from from Third Love and mm -hmm. I be, believe the CTO is going to be speaking today. Yeah. And I got the first ad, you know, pointed to me on Instagram. I believe, mm -hmm. and how seamless it was mm -hmm. to be able to explore, okay, what are the mm -hmm. sizes, what are the colors, mm -hmm. what what do I understand about this brand mm -hmm. and the, the ethos mm -hmm. um, that drives this? Mm -hmm. And not only do I want to purchase something great and have a great checkout experience mm -hmm. and, and overall experience through the order, pro through the order process, mm -hmm. but I also want to connect to the brand's mm -hmm. mission. You want to be inspired. Yeah. You want to be engaged. You also want to be, you know, treated, um, you know, not only with respect and you want to buy with confidence, you want to know who you're working with and you want to feel really good about that um, entire process. So yeah. it is about inspiration. It is about personalization and it's about frictionless shopping yeah. and buying yeah. when you're ready, right. Yeah. Uh, to, to make that kind of decision. And I think um, it's going to be interesting, you know, back to generative AI and AI. Uh, you know, I think 
thinking about how the what the impact is all the way back into design mm -hmm. and the opportunity now to use these tools as a designer to say, okay, what are what are the opportunities around this or what could the likely feedback be from the market right. when I bring these types of things to, to market? And you already see data being synthesized and other opportunities to do demand forecasting, for example, or to visualize the product more effectively right. and actually test it before you've invested in manufacturing. Right. And so, you know, and then of course the fast fashion movement, mm -hmm. you know, we can, we can have a discussion about how good some of that is for yeah. the environment or for the culture, but there's no question that, you know, uh, the acceleration, whether it's Zara or shine and others have been able to really accelerate capitalizing on memes, capitalizing on trends very yeah. quickly and user using data. AI, yeah. you know, yeah. to do that. And for designers, such as what you you know, your passion uh, around uh, fashion uh, design, you know, that those same tools are going to become democratized yeah. uh, throughout the industry. And it'll be very interesting to see all the way back into that supply chain, yeah. uh, how that works. I'm really looking forward to the interviews that we have going on today and really diving into the minds mm -hmm. of the leaders that are pushing forth these ideas and these, and yeah. these tools and how they're implementing them across mm -hmm. teams and, you know, talking to dev, talking to engineering, but also what that end, that end user yeah. is going to feel into experience. And I think a lot about how much the shopping, the online shopping experience has changed and transformed. And some of it may be by the force of, the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And when we think about how being home and the influx of folks who were like, yeah. we're decorating our homes for the first time. And so the, the uptick in just yeah. retail sales, yeah. because folks were like, okay, I guess I can finally like get that garage project completed. You know, I can finally- Oh, trust me. I did a lot of that kind of thing. Right, yeah, right. I was kind of like Marie condoing yeah. like my whole place. <laughs> you know, I was like, it's time to get organized here, people. <laughs> we're gonna use this time very well. And so I think about how much um, the, that, that, you know, merchants were having to think about truly who their customer is because you're getting this influx. Mm -hmm. Folks are sitting at home. Mm -hmm. Our offices are now mm -hmm. in our homes. If we're not leaving mm -hmm. and going to that third space every day, how are we creating third mm -hmm. spaces within our homes and elevating our entire experience, yeah. our, our lived experience, right? I think we can talk about the technology and the, the, the generative nature of AI mm -hmm. and like the ease of use that it provides. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, it's about creating a sense of quality of being yeah. for the end user experience. Yeah. And when we think about the way in which our lives are touching AI, I mean, even just down to, I can order my groceries right through my, my artificial assistant at home, yeah, right? right? And like, what does that experience? Or How does to, that go back to like, you know, working on your, 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 your home office and what have you. Mm -hmm. And it's like the ability to visualize and understand like, yes, this is, this is all going to work. This is going to help the, the aesthetic I'm going for, yeah. um, the size, the dimensions, what have you is going to work for me. Like yep. that is AI, even though, you know, the customer may not perceive it that way all the time. Yeah. Um, you know, I think done well, the customer just feels like it's a very enriched experience and that it's personalized for them and it's quick and it's responsive and it's knowledgeable. Yeah. Um, bringing, and not inaccessible. Bringing a lot to the table. Not complicated. Correct. Because if my 90 year old grandfather yes. can use his phone to, um, and, and my, my grandfather uh, was in construction yeah. and, and, and he was an aircraft technician at Boeing. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, for him, it's like if he's, he's looking on the Home Depot yeah. app. Yeah. And he wants to buy a knob for the yeah. cabinet because yeah. he wants to fix that at 90 years old. Yeah. That entire experience has to be immersive in a yeah. way that no matter who is using it. But easy. It's easy. easy. It's easy. Yeah. Yeah. And we may not ex understand Intuitive. all the mechanics yeah. behind it. We That's just right. know that it works really well. Yeah. And even just down to like, yes, the home office. I did an entire virtual um, decorative experience with a designer using a tool that mm -hmm. allowed me to use my phone, yep. go around the room yep. to get the dimensions. And then there was a full visual of my mm -hmm. place and they could place furniture, yeah. you know, in an augmented way. Yeah. So I could see, well, this is what the room is going to look like. And then from there, the pieces that I wanted, I can go and select yeah. and I can, I can order 
yep. and then everything just comes to me. Right. And in some ways, it's a better experience than going into a showroom or a store yes, because you so are actually able to be in that environment while you're having that discussion mm -hmm. and you can be comfortable and relaxed. You don't feel pressured in the same way you may, uh, depending on, on, on who you're working with. And so, you know, that's what, that's a great example of how the customer experience is already evolving using AI. We're going to be talking to many different companies and startups who are here uh, with us at the Edge Summit, um, talking about how to use AI to better understand the emotional reaction of your customers so that you can engage with them more effectively, how to understand their language, which I think is a very interesting. I'm looking forward to that conversation. A couple of different startups that we're talking to today who are kind of uh, you know, tackling that part of the, the, the problem. And what makes that so interesting to me is I think it, it actually opens up uh, for more diversity. You can someone, think of someone who's a non-native speaker. You can think of someone whose culture is like kind of outside the mainstream who may use different language to describe yeah. what they're looking for, uh, different slang. So suddenly generative AI tools not only can understand maybe the emotional side of what a customer's doing or trying to accomplish and help tune yeah. the response, but then understanding a much wider range of communication. And I think many of you here joining us online, you know, are dealing with internationalization every day and you know how complicated and, and expensive a process that can be. And you also recognize that the end result that you've been working with for years hasn't really been tuned to your brand or tuned to the customer. And now we have an opportunity to change that. We're also talking to analytics and back office tool providers who are using generative AI to kind of democratize, for example, access to analytics. So mm -hmm. think of your best intern or your best analyst sitting right next to you, right? Mm -hmm. And basically being on the journey with you as you just describe what you're looking for in a natural language way versus having to dig through reports or configure reports and things that... Right. Like I, for example, might feel like, mm, this is a little outside my depth. I better ask someone for someone else's help. And then it's weeks and weeks and weeks. And then when I need to turn down, turn around for a different query and understand some different dimension of the business, it's another couple of weeks. That's too slow. That's too slow. Yeah. So, so now, the, now we're really seeing knowledge now being able to be resurfaced. and Exactly and right. Up. So you can yeah. think about sort of democratizing the back office. So yeah. now someone who doesn't have as much experience or the same level of skills mm -hmm. has access to the information and access to these tools. And then we're talking to, you know, companies who are focused on the, the content uh, production, which I think is super interesting, right? I think that's what many people have sort of latched onto because yeah. that's what we as consumers who are engaging with a chat GPT or, or, or Bing or what have you, Google are already sort of playing with. Many of you may also be playing with some of the other tools, but we've got writer.com here. We've got businesses who are focused on visual, like, you know, image production using generative AI. What's exciting to me about that yeah. is that's an unlock for personalization. We, you know, Bloomreach, for example, and many others for years now have been building optimization tools meant to help improve, you know, what gets presented to a customer in a search result, how to lay out a category page, what gets presented on social media, what gets presented in, in marketing communications. And we have solutions that are using machine learning and doing that really effectively. Mm -hmm. But there's been a big barrier, and that is content variation, because content, traditionally, very expensive. Even creating one version of your digital experience is a lot of work. Create many different versions of that mm -hmm. experience so that you can optimize, you know, color, language, subject line, all these different things. Yeah. That's been a chore. And then certainly creating graphics and images and content blocks. I mean, you're never going to get to it. So yeah. leveraging the personalization tools has been really held back inside many organizations. And I'm looking forward to how generative AI can create content variations, keep it within the brand language, keep it within the brand presentation, and create a huge opportunity to leverage the personalization and optimization tools. Yeah. So we're going to be talking about that today as well, which I'm really looking forward to. That's going to be really to. exciting yeah. because it completely changes the dynamics of the user experience. It does. And just from the the, the, the layperson's terms, yeah. the, the person who on the receiving end of these experiences, mm -hmm 
it becomes really annoying when you're getting messaging yeah. that makes absolutely no sense based on the experience you may have had with the merchant. Yeah. Right. It's like, wait, did you not just see my data? Like I actually purchased yeah. this. I didn't purchase this. So the messaging that I receive should be tailored towards mm -hmm. what might I be wanting next? Yeah. And how does that get influenced through the email marketing campaign right. that I might receive? Or if there is going to be a pop up and like, hey, you know, we saw that you're looking at yeah. this, you know, and, and in some ways, I mean, and we're going to also be talking about some of the ethics around the AI yeah. and the use of data, which is a has been, of course, topic du jour. Mm -hmm. um, but also, you know, how do you use that data to create these personalized experiences yeah. in a way that doesn't feel creepy, but almost feels like that. <laughs> But yeah. feels like more like a best no, friend. Let's like not a, be creepy. Right, right, yeah. right. But but but, but, <laughs> but feels like a best friend. Yeah, that yeah. if you are sitting in a room and, and you're you're asking your best friend's opinion about it's you know right. how do these shoes look, um, that, well, that you're gonna yeah, get... we'll be honest. Right. Well, <laughs> brutally. <laughs> But hopefully, hopefully the, the brand tonality comes through. If you've done your job well, <laughs> it will be very honest. But just thinking about what we mean by that idea of personalization and again, on the consumer side, yeah. how it goes back to everything that you said, like yeah. how the emotional side of how you want your, your yeah. customer, your client to feel. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Another, I think, interesting area that we're going to talk about is the evolving customer experience. You, mm -hmm. you did share kind of a, a story around visualization earlier, which I think is super interesting. Another way in which we're gonna likely see the customer experience really evolve here soon is we as customers are starting to get very comfortable with conversational experiences that are actually very good and very helpful. Yeah. Um, and so now, you know, consumers are becoming not only more comfortable with it, but may actually gravitate toward that. And so the old paradigms of how websites, digital experiences on apps and everything have been laid out, which frankly put a lot of um, the effort on the customer's, uh, you know, a lap, you know, to sort through and do, and sometimes kind of a chore, you know, honestly, yeah. when you're looking for something, the experience may evolve pretty dramatically. And even channels that we've really thought of as kind of one way static channels like email, uh, like SMS uh, marketing, um, or even social will start to transition. And then of course, new, I shouldn't say new, but channels that really have kind of lagged have not been very interesting, like shopping via a, a television, for example, not really very useful to me. I'm not going to spend my time doing that. Yeah. Um, you know, I might have an interactive TV, but it's, you know, the experience isn't very good. Um, suddenly I can imagine, um, you know, one of my passions is uh, fly fishing and I've been wanting to, to get a fishing kayak. So just imagine me on a Saturday morning with my cup of coffee, um, you know, sitting in front of my, uh, I have an outdoor television as well. So I might even be in front of my outdoor television um, <laughs> um, and, and, and having a conversation with an AI that's interacting with me and presenting me with options that I can then interrogate. I can ask questions about, I can ask the expert, right? which has been trained on the best knowledge available in its industry. So in this right. case, fishing kayaks, kind of a niche. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I can totally imagine in a high considered purchase, certainly like that, or in a situation like, hey, I, this is my blazer. Um, I'm not really feeling very comfortable with my ability to match a bunch of stuff to this, mm -hmm. but I want to extend my wardrobe. Okay, now I can have a very different kind of conversation with a system. Right. And frankly, I know that this isn't necessarily what, what many of us are hoping for, but the reality is it may actually be better than interacting with most salespeople. Because while great salespeople are amazing and they're, you know, when you interact with one, you're like, oh, they're fantastic. Let me buy um, everything. Right? <laughs> right. But many salespeople, you know, are relatively new to their jobs don't necessarily have training or just may not be very good at what they're doing or care about it enough. And so as a customer, you're like, I'd almost rather engage with a very, very knowledgeable AI that understands the entire range of products on offer yeah. and can actually help me, you know, get questions answered so that I feel yeah. really, really confident yeah. or tune things to my style versus their style. Yeah. So that's, there's, so we'll be talking about that today as well. And that's a kind of an interesting future look at how things might evolve in the customer experience, which I think is also really interesting. Yeah. I mean, I, I think about how much we are trained now um, to use technology tools that make it much more efficient 
and bring that that feel good when we interact with the brand. Yeah. And we are in this space of I see something maybe on, um, you know, again, on, on Instagram or on TikTok or I see an influencer yeah. who tells me that this is the best yeah. thing since sliced bread. Yeah. I don't want to take a million steps in yes. order to get to the purchase. Yes. I want to immediately say, yes. hey, let me go from this platform right. into my purchase experience. Oh, right. and by the way, please show me and demonstrate for me. That's take right. me on that customer journey that's going to allow me to engage with your brand so that now I will become mm -hmm. a lifelong customer. Yep. But I have such a positive experience and the the, the brand image and the brand experience yeah. is is thoroughly throughout any platform mm -hmm. that I'm that I'm on, not just on not just when I'm on the site or That's not right. just when I'm using the app, but throughout every single touch point, I am very much assured that what however I'm engaging with mm -hmm. with this particular company, I'm going to have a repeat experience that only continues to get better. That's right. And you know, we're kind of pushing the limits here a little bit as we think about this, but the reality is, you know, many uh, businesses, you know, on the on the periphery of commerce, uh, certainly are, are thinking about essentially AI personal assistance. They may even be embedded on our phones, um, and and you know, these large language models can actually be trained specifically to each individual. So mm -hmm. I can have one that is very much tuned to me, my interests, my way of communicating, my context in life. Yes. You know, my work, my family, all these things, right? Um, and you can imagine how shopping could really be a key part of that, whether it's, you know, the staples you need. I, I never want to be out of oat milk. Okay. <laughs> and I, I know my, my adult daughters are, uh, are, are home right now and I, I'm perpetually out of oat milk. It drives me crazy. Can we figure this out, please? <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have to just get you on subscription. And that's the other part. Get you on subscription. Well, the problem is my subscription would be for my oat milk. And then is it going to know that my house is full of other people and they're all like dipping right. into the oat milk like crazy? <laughs> yeah. Making matcha tea and like, oh, where did all the oat milk go? Oh, you had matcha tea this morning? Great. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I hope you got you had oat milk at breakfast today. That just sounds awful. I'm so sorry. <laughs> these are these are uh, these are first world problems, as yeah. we say. But <laughs> it's just an example of how you know that's another angle, right? Um, that it's just worth being open to. And I think those of us who've been in this industry for a long time have to recognize that in the twenty-five to thirty years of digital commerce and really the rise of digital marketing, things have really stabilized, right? And in fact, you could almost say kind of stagnated in the last ten years. And you mm -hmm. know. There's a paradigm on how a website's built. There's a paradigm on how a, what a great app looks like. There's a paradigm around online search and all these different tools or how marketing. And obviously, yeah. you know, it's, it's evolved a lot. But the reality is it's kind of been an established paradigm. Yeah. I think that paradigm is ripe for change. And so while many right now are feeling like, you know, AI and generative AI Talk about a fast hype cycle. We've almost gotten to the point now where I'm seeing article after article essentially claiming that AI's impact may have been dramatically overstated uh, mm -hmm. earlier this year and how the media got behind it. I think it's just more about timing and how things are going to evolve. I think it's going to have a massive impact. But my point that I was making there is really that, that as static as things have kind of become, they're ripe for a dramatic evolution. And when you look at how poor... Frankly, the online search experience has become. Mm -hmm. If you look at how poor the Amazon shopping experience has come, and by the way, I wrote a, a lengthy article about my point of view on Amazon retail, and I, while I think they've reached peak market share, uh, and why their uh, addiction to retail media uh, is a real challenge for them. Mm -hmm. So check that out. That's on the Cocktails and Commerce newsletter. Mm -hmm. But these experiences are, are no longer very good. And we have kind of been mm, slowly numbed into just being kind of okay with it. Right, right. So mm -hmm. that just means that we're ready for a major change, major yeah. shift. And it's ripe for innovation. It's ripe for ripe innovation for yeah. and disruption uh, to have an impact yeah. on, on the user experience. And then yeah. obviously, as we talked earlier, uh, generative AI is going to have a tremendous impact on how merchants and marketers work. Yeah, yeah. Right. And one angle here too, Brian, is... We also think about the idea of accessibility. Yes. And why the ease of use Such is so an critical. Important point. Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. And so I've, I've covered a lot of TED um, talks, uh, particularly around this idea that online spaces mm-hmm. have traditionally been unfriendly mm-hmm. to those with hidden Disabilities and or, unhidden disabilities. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right. That at one point there was like 95% mm-hmm. of websites were inaccessible to people who even had though there's seen regulation issues. in place, even with even with regulation, it's just ignored. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And so when you talk about the opportunities in generative AI, um, we're not just talking about, you know, users having the ease of purchase just for the sake of mm-hmm. making your life spending one second versus 30 seconds. We're also talking about people who they may be confined to their home. They don't have a ton of mobility, but Mm -hmm. they are purchasing products Mm -hmm. and services Mm -hmm. because they're not able to necessarily Mm -hmm. go into Mm -hmm. a physical space or Mm -hmm. place. Mm -hmm. They may not have the caregiving Mm -hmm. um, that is necessary to have Mm -hmm. their lives function. So their online experience Mm -hmm. and their shopping for their day-to-day lives Mm -hmm. is very critical. It is. And being able to make that, and, and even consciously as we're thinking about developing technologies mm-hmm. that can cater and be used yep. by by almost anyone, um, that's going to be such an important component of this ongoing evolution and the opportunity for innovation. Yeah, um, That, again, is beyond just, just that checkout cart, um, but it maybe enables an opportunity for someone to improve their quality of life just by nature of, oh, I can actually see this. Yeah. And it's going to, and, and maybe my, my assistant or my, my virtual assistant on this site isn't just typing text to me, Maybe it also has an opportunity for an audible feature Absolutely. that allows me to hear it in case I do have a, a sightseeing problem um, or or disability, excuse me. Um, so I, I'm really excited that we're going to be talking to experts in this space from very well-established companies. And then, as you mentioned, um, some of the startups that yeah. are, are stepping in and refining some of the, some of the shortcomings or yeah. some of the gaps um, that we're seeing. Absolutely. So we've got technology companies, services companies, retailers and brands you're going to hear from today. Now it's time, actually, to transition over to the main stage keynote, right? where you're going to see um, a host of keynotes. I think Amanda Elam Cole is kicking us off here this morning. And with that, Cheryl, thank you so much. Wonderful thank conversation. You. I look forward to the, to the yes. whole day and the afternoon uh, we have full of all these great conversations. And be well and enjoy. We'll see you back here soon.